everyone has to start the journey, but please go on the journey. Don't, don't arrest yourself. Don't limit yourself by other people. And that would include us mm. or, or anybody like that. Mm. If, if you have a calling, a true calling for this, you will not be able to stop. You, you will go on the journey and you will make your own discoveries and you, and you will find the truth, the objective truth that's lived out through your own life. Please do that. Hey guys, and welcome back to Young to Live By, the premier online outlet for depth psychology resources, giving you all the tools that you need to individuate properly, or in other words, become who you are. And today we thought it might be nice to have a little discussion, a little round table on creativity, because creativity is one of those subjects that has been requested quite a bit from you guys in the audience and the guys over in our Discord server. And it's kind of a, an interesting thing, how it might tie in with depth psychology, how it might tie in with instinct, how it might tie in with archetype and all those things, because all of us deep down have an urge to be creative in whatever form that it might take. It doesn't have to be the more traditional outlets, such as painting and dancing and everything else. Of course, they count and they're perfectly valid, but it can be a general sense, as we discussed, in one of the most previous videos, a positive libido coming out of you, your life force manifesting. And so how this ties in with the rest of depth psychology and how you can use it on your own individuation journey, and indeed how to use it therapeutically, would be quite a cool subject to go into, I think. So Steve, I want to open up first of all by asking you about this idea of symbols, essentially. And we have this FAQ document, which of course we will we will share at some point. It's been shared in the Discord. We could do a, a video on this in the near future, going over an FAQ for psychosystems analysis. You know, what is psychosystems analysis? How does it tie into lots of other things like Jung's other works, etc. And in it, you've written down things about how you used creativity in your own therapeutic practice, along with Pauline, of course. So where do the symbols come from that you use in a therapeutic practice? Are they, you know, culturally defined symbols that we that, that we find all over the place? Do they come from dreams? Do they come from, you know, spontaneously drawing them? Like, where, where are the symbols through which we should use creatively in a useful, productive sense come from? Right, well, mm. that's a, a very good question. Just, just to return back to the, the general notion of being occupied, preoccupied with acquired symbols the great danger it, it, with symbols is their inductive power, by which I mean they're hypnotic. They can fix your attention. And because they fix your attention, they can occupy and narrow consciousness to the point where pretty much anything else is excluded. And this is a very, very old technique in hypnotherapy, for example. And I'm going right back now to the days of James Braid with his fixed gaze or fixed attention. He would talk about a dominance or fixed idea that would occupy a person's attention. Um, now that's a dramatic example in some respects, but in, in terms of just acquiring a symbol from the outside and then letting that take you over, you, you actually have such a narrowing of consciousness and simultaneously such a lowering of it, you become more unconscious. And that's not a good way to approach symbols because you're not intended to become unconscious in the face of a true symbol. You're meant to interact with it as a kind of dialectic and then become more conscious and it's an ongoing process. So if we're working mm. uh, clinically with fixed symbols and an example of that would be say the sand tray technique, then yes, you do have to provide the opportunity for someone to select and work with real external fixed uh, symbols. And that sounds like a contradiction because I've just said that you shouldn't occupy consciousness with a symbol to the point where it just reduces and you become more unconscious. But remember that this is a specific kind of situation and it's one where you're deliberately creating resistance. The resistance is in the media that you choose. So something like a sand tray, clinically, would in and of itself be a projective object. It's a, it's a space which is demarked and it's a world within which you invite someone to just naturally without thinking about it too much project into by asking them and by by this this point by the way you you have prepared them through work they already have some idea what the unconscious is we would have got gone through other techniques first and we may well have reached an impasse where verbal communication is going nowhere for whatever reason so you have 
what would have been called in the old days a transference resistance. And that's still an applicable term. But I prefer to think in this specific context of the resistance of the material, of the medium that you're using. So you would have a sound tray world, which is a container, within which is just a flat piece of sound. Then you have several shells with all sorts of different uh, symbols, if you like. They, they could be something like you know wooden blocks, they could be figurines, they could be cars, houses, mm. animals. We had tons of them, didn't we? We had tons of them, mm. uh, trees. Mm. Whole, as much as you can get, you can never have mm. too much. No. And then just allow the person to feel comfortable enough to know that they are facing the expressive space, the projective space. And then ask them then to select something and then just make a sound, make a picture, a sound picture and, and just do it. And at this point, there is no interpretation at all. So you leave a person with the tension that they've agreed to the task and then that they come up against their own inner resistance and that that collides further with the external resistance of the medium. So they then end up being forced to pick symbols that they may not like or may, it doesn't quite feel right. That in itself becomes a process that they will kick against as they work with the medium. And gradually, you get a picture. And on the basis of experience, assuming that it's a right-handed person and not left-handed, and they're not ambidextrous, and you, you'd have known all of this, you'd have worked this out uh, beforehand, there is a basic set of interpretative rules. They're, they're fundamental, and they're, they're, they're open to change, obviously to do with how the sound tray is used. So if you think of it as rectilinear and there's four corners, obviously, and then there's a center. Um, the obvious Jungian interpretation is that this invites a mandala. Well, maybe, but it's more dynamic than that with, uh, with sound tray. And the relative positioning of things um, very much suggests what's coming in, what's going out and what the relative energies are. So sand tray is very, very important. Now the classical Jungian way of dealing with, with a sand tray is so slow, it's glacial. Yes. You may as well just walk out the room and come back <laughs> after the next ice age. <laughs> when you've got a beard, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, not only do they not interpret, and I'll come back to interpretation in a minute, because you cannot exclude interpretation, although they try to. It's a nonsense, you just can't do it. But not only do they attempt, shall I say, to, to, to not interpret what goes on, they just leave a person for months to play around in, in, in sand trays in the hope that something will spontaneously emerge and change. And then if the person just gets well over that period of time anyway, they attribute that to the process of just leaving a person sat in front of a sand tray whilst they play. Uh, I mean, in, in frontline healthcare, that just doesn't wash. You don't have the time. No. Also, people who are suffering generally don't have the time. So a lot of classical or orthodox uh, young, young patients um, indulge themselves in the process of being indulged they do. and therefore they self-select. But we were able to use the sound tray as a creative media for interacting with the unconscious very, very positively and progressively in relatively brief and focal therapy. And not just in terms of analysis in the classical sense, but also in terms of accessing somatic processes and even disease pro or supposed disease processes that may not have been a complete disease as such or only just a disease, but a condition that involved changes somatically and also psychologically and psychosocially, biopsychosocial. And we were able to do this and we refined it over many, many years of finding the best and most efficient way of working with that. And a lot of it comes in the preparation with the person that you're working with. And with a sand tray anyway, we would generally not go near that unless we'd already met a resistance to other forms of treatments. Yeah. And it was absolutely necessary at that point to get past that uh, resistance for them. Bearing in mind that resistance often appears for good reasons. Resistance uh, can arise because you're doing something wrong. Or the, it's not that you're doing it wrong, it's just that your approach has been incomplete or that something simply hasn't been mis or has been misunderstood or not understood. And it could be by you or it could be by the person that you're working with. Now, it's, it's respectful to the psyche that when you come up against resistance, you offer it a way to express itself. 
and there are many, many different options symbolically. Um, it, it can go right up to, to a full-blown enactment, which we've, we've uh, discussed before, which can be extremely stressful, but very, very transformative if it's handled properly. So we would regard sound tray as being a relatively gentle way of giving the psyche a chance to do a night's move around the conscious resistance of the person or the resistance of the therapist, perhaps, uh, because they have an agenda which could be, you know, I don't want to work with this person anymore, they bore me. That can happen. Carl Jung said it himself, you know, and we're all human, it can happen. Mm. Or it could be that this isn't working quickly enough and my ego says it should be, so I'll blame the patients. Um, these are all aspects of counsel transference that can arise. Or it can simply be that this person's type, right, prefers something like that. And this is where you have to be very, very sensitive to the nuances of an individual in, in, in a situation. But we did find that the, so long as somebody was, was either carefully prepared or the overall indication suggested that we use Sanchez, that you would get a result very, very quickly with that and you'd get a breakthrough easily on the level of dream analysis. Sometimes, you know, dreams just can lead you astray. They can lead a merry dance for all sorts of reasons, which we can discuss uh, perhaps at a later date. But um, the sound tray, once it's physically there and it's sitting in front of a person, and at that stage you make no interpretation unless they offer one, at which point it's valid then to get involved in a dialectical exchange. You leave it there, you treat it with respect, and you leave it there when other people come into the room, and maybe they're, they're, they're having therapy as well, and it's just sitting there, right? It, it becomes an exteriorization person goes away and their psyche is reacting to it they've been reassured it's going to stay there they may have taken a photograph of it or, or whatever so they can take it away with them but the real physicality of it is sitting there and it's as if that acts then uh, almost like uh, something for at Stonehenge or something that works on a ley line with respect to how they project into it it's an attractor that is drawing at a remote distance energy towards it they know it's there they know it's there and then the psyche says this is what it means and they come back and they look at it and they tell you something and then they say, I don't need it anymore. We can deal with it. So that's an, an example of how you can use the resistance of that specific media to access all sorts of different things. Now, with respect to disease processes or supposed disease processes, it may not be a real disease in terms of its origin, but it's operating at, at a level of um, somatic expression. And it may well be that you can then, through the use of, of these symbols and the interpretation of them, which is an ongoing process or it can be, you can actually transduce that back up and out from the body to consciousness where it can be dealt with. And that is the key thing about symbols in all forms of expressive, creative art media is that the symbol is another kind of language and it has a bandwidth which is far wider and deeper than that of consciousness it's the same in dreams yeah okay so on the just to get into the more mechanics of how something like this might work because mm. it interests me i'm sure it interests the guys watching as well so you mentioned earlier that when you're doing the sand tray thing you've got little uh, wooden objects and things around um, so they obviously aren't symbols but they are things basically yes. just sort of entities what's what's the purpose of those in the in the general creative process of somebody coming up with an image in the sand Right, well, by using them to articulate a pattern, the pattern in itself becomes a symbol which is constructed or made up of things, of artifacts, which in and of themselves aren't symbols, but in common parlance would be referred to as being symbolic of. So in that sense, they're all effectively signs or representations, but how they affect the psyche is the most important thing. Hmm. The reaction that occurs then is very often symbolic. Yeah. So it's the, the, it's the internal interpretation of the external medium that produces the symbol. So you're not, as you say, working really with symbols. You're working with things that represent symbols. And as with normal projection, which always requires a hook upon which to hang itself, these signs become the hooks. And the overall pattern and energy and movement dynamics that are appeared or appear to be present in that still Santre representation becomes this this process which they then animate with energy 
um, from within and it produces a whole battery of symbols and transformative changes which once mm. you've got that information you can then go back and use another kind of technique that perhaps wasn't going anywhere earlier there was resistance to it and you needed to use that one to bypass the resistance and then reaccess another another technique yeah okay so the the actual objects then that, that are there just so i'm clear i guess is there any selective process that goes into putting these if i understand them as prompts basically prompts yeah. for the psyche to look at and then they the psyche yeah. itself generates the actual symbol when when you said pauline they could be anything mm. is there any kind of qualifier to sort of bring them down into say the most potent thing that the, that is most likely to generate a response in the patient's psyche if you sort of see what i mean um well i i guess um I just think of what Steve said earlier about having a proper case history as well, because with all these things, you have to um, have as much information about the patient as possible. Um, and it might be that, as with lots of things in therapy, really, that you might have things available that I guess in advance you, you're kind of assuming that they might be drawn to or attracted to. So um, I, I guess the you can make it bespoke in that way, but it, it, it's probably important that those things are still embedded in the array of signs or um, uh, figurines or objects that you have so that it, it doesn't, at least on the surface, appear to be something that you, you're constructing. But um, it, it's important to have, um, I think, a, as big an array of, of things as you, you can practically in the room so that, you know, you, you, you kind of... Um, how can I put it? I guess you're sort of assisting that process in a way because you know something of that person's background, but at the same time, you're not being prescriptive in that you're being too overt about what you, you know, the way in which maybe you're trying to encourage that person to go. So we, we always had, I mean, it helped to have young children at the time, to mm. be honest with you, mm. because <laughs> obviously they have lots of toys and things. The, the, and, uh, Simpsons figurines. Yes. Uh, Doctor Who yes, figurines. The just Daleks, about every, Doctor, yes, anything the from the culture uh, yeah. is useful. Um, yes, sorry, Steve. No, sorry, I was going to mention one chap, actually, um, and this isn't specifically <clears throat> Santre, but we actually had a model of the TARDIS <clears throat> for our enactments. Yeah. Um, he took a black cloth and mm. laid it out on the floor and that mm. was the impenetrable space that he could not get beyond to solve his problem. Yeah. And when he saw the TARDIS there, yes. grabbed it and yes. he was able to go because yeah. the TARDIS can go anywhere. Yeah. So in that sense, he was within the TARDIS, which was, is when you think about it, a, a, an hermetically sealed vessel. Mm. At least originally it was. And I, when I say originally, I haven't watched the new series uh, very much. Uh, but when I go back to the original series, 1963, which I watched on, on first transmission, shows how old I am, it was a hermetically sealed vessel. It was inviolable on the inside. Mm. And you could go anywhere in it, although you didn't necessarily know where you were going to go. But that, and it was powered by Mercury, by the way, which mm -hmm. again, you know, is, is a hermetic uh, image. He, anyway, he was able to mm. go within this, this vessel and cross the impenetrable barrier. Uh, and that was spontaneous. Mm. But you would have known something about his interests in advance. I would, yeah. yeah. Yes, so, yeah. so, you know, in, in, in that sense, um, I, I guess you're kind of assisting the process, but, but uh, like I say, not in an overt way yeah. that would, you know... So, so yeah, so, so, yeah. He, so he used the, the black cloth himself to illustrate that dark space, almost like the event horizon of a black hole or an infinite extension of oblivion that, that he felt he could not cross. Mm. But once he had the, the vessel to do it, and then when he realised that it's a small TARDIS, I can't get in it, but it can get inside me. And that the TARDIS, it, it has uh, relative dimensions bigger on the inside than the outside. Yeah. This caused an almost origami-like enfolding of his consciousness. So he's able to put himself inside something that was smaller than him to become bigger and then to feel safe and allow him to transform and to travel. So that was a really good use by him spontaneously of symbols. Yeah. But the symbol is the process then and not the object that you project onto it, which I think was what you were saying earlier about how can you use a fixed sign or a fixed object to represent something which is either dynamic or very, very unconscious. Well, the answer is it's an emergent thing. It's an emergent process that comes from within. Hmm. Okay. Okay, that's definitely interesting about the whole the whole TARDIS thing. I guess this is why you might ask in, in in therapy more personal questions to somebody, 
you know yeah. so it's like yeah. what's you know maybe in today's culture what's your favorite video game or something because i know oh. for me then that would definitely be a potent symbol i did actually because i've mentioned i've had a very strong reaction to or a very strong attachment to to dead space 2 and even to the point where i used to have an action figure even though i was a grown man and this is mm-hmm. not attacking people who have action figures but it's yeah. definitely a thing i had oh. this action, action figure of the main character on my desk all the time everywhere i'd go and i couldn't go anywhere else sort of without it so yes. it's kind of something that i was unconsciously attached to and so i'm sure that yes. that would have generated something but on on say the sand tray stuff say you you set the the exercise up and and the patient draws an, an image mm-hmm. within the sand what's the qualifier as much as you can have a qualifier for how valid the image is and i mean this purely in a scientific method kind of sense to be yeah. like you know they they, they could draw something like a house and it's like is that just a house if you see what i mean or is that a, a thing which could be used as yeah. a way in to help the patient relieve their suffering well um they tend not to draw with the fingers though sometimes mm. they will they'll tend in that case to either get something which is relatively abstract like a wooden block or a house because we had houses mm. there that, that we used ones from you know railway my brother's a railway modeler so we used to borrow and not return uh, a lot of his, uh, his railway stuff. Yeah. Um, they, they would use a real house as such. And remember, these are prompts. There are, there are layers within layers within layers. It's basically an onion, if you like. And what you see is not necessarily what you get. You know, you have to, to go into it. So it's an ongoing dialectical process, which you witness uh, and then get involved in when they're ready. Now that might sound like we're doing the same, say, as Dora Kalf, the late Dora Kalf, who we, we were in, in contact with, who sadly uh, died before we, we could meet her, who was the uh, the leading Santre uh, therapist, if you like, in, in, in Zurich over uh, with the youngins over there. Um, but we would differ from her because we, w- we want and would need in our lives uh, and in the culture in which we live to me or get a result very, very quickly. So in that sense, we are involved, but at an appropriate moment. And how do you know what an appropriate moment is? Well, you can't be prescriptive about that because it emerges from the interaction you have with the person you're working with and what they say or indicate that they want. So the whole thing is like that. What you see in the tray is the surface. That's the preoccupation in a way of consciousness through projection. The interpretative process is a reaction to what emerges rather than getting ahead and interpreting a person. So in that sense, it is truly dialectical that there is a statement, if you like, from the psyche that, that comes out through the person and into the sound world. They react to it and they bounce that reaction off you for a counter reaction. And your own psyche is engaged with this as well. And then the psyche of the person who's working knows by now it's already assessed you and what your likely bandwidth of uh, ability and tolerances are, because, you know, their psyche is always present. And you have that four-way um, interaction that you see, for example, in Collective Work 16, in the Rosarium. You, you should really take that as a metaphor, not just for the alchemical process or for the standard therapeutic relationship, where there's an interaction between two people becoming four, but with any media that you use, those four are still present. And this is why I say overwhelmingly, if you're interested in Carl Jung's work, really interested in it, then you go to Collective Work 16. You don't go to ION. One day I'll explicate exactly why I think that's a quite a serious mistake. But if you're really interested in self-knowledge and on working on yourself or with other people, Collective Work 16, that's the master text. That's the one to go to. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've got, um, so obviously you two, you're in your practice, you're helping people with sand trays as one of the things which you might do. What other kinds of creative things would you would you do? You've got, you've got here in this um, this FAQ document, which we could do a video on in, in general, or, or yeah, the, I know it's been shared in, in the Discord server. You've got things on there like dance, movement, sculpture, things like that, painting. Um, did you use all of those things over the course of your career as well? We didn't. It, well, we, we had paints available, didn't we, too, we did, as well yeah. as the sand trays. Um, so that if people wanted to come in and, and paint, they could do. Um, yeah, again, it just it, it's very much patient specific in that regard, um, and just really following up on where where the patient leads you, whatever their preferences are, and it, it doesn't have to be. Again, I guess in that sense, um, 
technically good. It, it, it really doesn't matter what your technical ability is. And we mm -hmm. had people with all sorts of backgrounds and, and levels of ability come in and just, just try things out. I guess we wanted it to be as experimental as possible. Mm. Okay. Uh, and the main thing really was to just have as much as we possibly could in a practical sense, because obviously you've got the, the constraints of, of the room and the setup and being in a GP's practice and so on. But we, we did everything we possibly could to facilitate that. Yeah. I mean, if somebody wanted to um, maybe do, I don't know, something like dance therapy or whatever, and, and we couldn't accommodate it, then we'd probably encourage it in some other way in some other context. Yeah. So always use enactment. Always use enactment. Yes, absolutely. And we can incorporate into that. Yeah. 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 But um, I, I think more than anything, the um, the idea of making something it's the thing that stands out for me really of a, of a look across all the media that we used was the importance of making something bespoke for someone mm -hmm. at every level, and and because the biopsychosocial model influenced our thinking and still influences our thinking today that gave us the flexibility to do that so we could literally look at every level um and over time decide what were the right interventions for that person so you know if they required if they had some kind of say for example um anxiety then We'd liaise with the with the doctors, with the medical staff, maybe to get them on a minor tranquilizer of some kind. Uh, we could work with them psychologically through the the media that we've just described, um, and then obviously, you know, beyond that, to sort of social and environmental factors, we 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 consider all these yeah. things as uh, as being um, incredibly influential on that person. Mm. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I say, the idea of making it bespoke was the thing that mattered to mm -hmm. us. So if we did an enactment, for example, we'd, we'd know as much as we possibly could about that person before we put everything together. So we'd have we'd have an array of props, if you like, again, on, on a sort of like a, a, a big trestle table at the back of the room. But the, within that, there would have to be things that we knew to be important to that person psychologically and um, sometimes we'd even go as far as to know what their musical interests were mm -hmm. uh, and at some significant point in the process we'd somebody would get under the table <laughs> and flick a switch yeah, and put a particular me. yeah <laughs> put a particular under. piece of music on mm. so well, every... <laughs> well, well, would distract them and I'd, I'd sneak off into the shadows yeah. literally and then <laughs> under the table and there'd be a, be a hidden um, ghetto blaster in there yeah, or something. Yeah, it would, in those days, <laughs> a ghetto blaster, yeah. Annie Lennox's wife, yes, one, I always remember, yes. had a massive effect on someone. Had a huge impact like, because you yeah. just simply weren't expecting it. Yeah. But you really do have to do your homework yeah. for that. You have to have do as much of the preparation as you can beforehand. Like I said, without it being um, too sort of... Um, constructed it, it shouldn't appear that way it should appear that and, and it is obviously a, a spontaneous process but within that you have to really know what would work for that patient and mm. you can only do that by working with them in depth and getting a full case history and uh, so on and so forth yeah mm. Yeah, I really, really like the it really resonates what you're saying the whole bespoke part of it because it was it, it has to uh, be it, yeah. it absolutely has to be because it because if in a way if it's not what are you doing you know if you if you reduce something to psychology it's it's bad if you reduce something to biology it's bad if you don't yeah. take a person's social context into account that's not a good thing either so that's the, that's the beauty of the model really is it gives you that degree of flexibility but it also allows you to make a bespoke intervention as well yeah, yeah. so it's also nothing that young himself did not do and yes. has been completely pretty yes. much forgotten that's true yeah. because you know he was a medic and therefore the the, the physiological medical side of it was immediately mm. taken into consideration yes he worked creatively he worked with dreams he worked with all sorts of uh, creative media yeah. and of course he was an analyst yeah. so all three were present and he used all three yes uh, these days uh, people like dora kalf the late dora kalf is, is something of an outlier with orthodox youngians they talk an awful lot about creative media but they seldom use them mm. uh, and they've pretty much lost all of their connection to the body scientifically mm. some of them do talk about 
you know, the way that tension will turn up in the body and, and uh, along the lines of Wilhelm Reich and the like. And all of that is perfectly valid as far as it goes, but mm. it is still within level in terms of an explanation. Mm. Because tension within the body has a neuroendocrine profile associated with it, which will have effects other than only that. And it, it's so, so important to have that very, very broad bandwidth understanding. Yes. And then know that there are languages, if you like, which can translate between psyche and soma and between soma and psyche and between both of them out into the social and cultural, yes. natural as well, environment. Because people relate to things in the environment. They relate to places. Jung understood this. He said places are numinous, mm. that they have an energy. The land has a psyche of its own. Many, many people resonate with that. And many people can get a healing uh, interaction with a place rather mm. than a person or a thing because the place has some kind of symbolic or sympathetic resonance with them and you know I've done this with people I've taken people to places so that they can experience that place and then place that within their personal myth but usually to make that effective you actually have to extract rather like a dentist would their personal myth out from the pollution of the overriding collective myths that they've taken on board through their life in an attempt to understand themselves, but their personal myth has become lost. So you have to take them out of that context. So they don't think that they're living in Star Wars or Star Trek or Doctor Who or anything like that. Mm. Because the minute you do identify solely with something like that, and you can do because you can get a very pleasant rush of oxytocin because you're identifying with some character or figure. Mm. And that's great in a way, feel nice temporarily and then you don't feel so nice and then you have to see it again you have to identify again with that process that runs through your mind like an unanalyzed dream it's a repetition compulsion so you need to be able to disengage someone from a containing collective myth <clears throat> and make it so personal that they're at the axis spiritum the actual through line of their life around which everything is gathered that's good and that's bad and the symbol becomes the key to getting to that and also to, to communicating that up to consciousness where hopefully it can be integrated. But you don't help somebody in a vacuum. If you change a person, you change every social relationship mm -hmm. they have. So it's the, on the basic level, if somebody's having a problem in their life and they come in, it could be the woman, for example, and then you change her therapeutically, their marriage might go out the window. Yes. Yeah you've interfered with the stability of that system mm. so all of these things have to be taken into consideration mm. we're not just physical we are not just psychological we're not just psychosocial we are also environmental and we are the same thing at every level of representation and you make a change at one of those levels you will automatically change the others this mm. is the principle of self-regulation and homeostasis mm. at work and this is why you really, really do have to have your head screwed on over what you're doing. Mm. And, when, and when you work with, with uh, transformative symbols, you know you, you, you're pulling on something which is huge potentially in terms of can it be integrated into consciousness without causing a disturbance? Can that then be integrated into that person's psychosocial environment without causing problems? All of this is really, really important. And sometimes symbols actually are very useful because... They remain unconscious, but just show themselves a little bit of a glimmer because they are then the containing vessel for forces which could not be integrated and they have to stay in a symbolic form and you have to have some distance, acknowledgement of their, of their existence, but you leave it there and you don't try and bring that into consciousness. The acknowledgement is enough sometimes to create a homeostasis. If you mess with that and try and power it through, you can cause problems. So this is where experience comes in, mm. proper assessment, mm. proper knowledge about all the different factors that, that there are intruding into somebody's life, including your own. It's not easy. It's not a case of reading books. It's a case of getting real experience. Yeah. You have to start with reading books. Yeah. You have to start on yourself. You have to have a real intention to solve the problem of yourself, your personal equation, obviously, because that defines your limitations. But if you're going to help somebody else, you have to be really, really careful. You know, don't get inflated. Don't go around interpreting people's dreams, mm. you know, just off the cuff. Mm. It's just what I don't do it on the Discord. I will not get involved in that. Mm. I don't think it's harmful as such for, for, for the guys doing it there because they are learning. They're cutting their teeth on things. But as they progress, 
doors will open they don't even know exist yet they will do in time because they're all you know genuine people i can tell that uh, by watching them watching their interactions and this is very very positive but ultimately you have to be very very careful can I, can I just, yeah. sorry Sue, can you just add, add no it's okay, <laughs> can you just add something to that on, on maybe a, a bit of a more mundane level really, but if, if you if you don't study science and, and if you don't uh, have an understanding, uh, for example, of um, the things that Steve's describing, the biology, the, the psychoneuroendocrine pathways and immunological pathways and so on, you don't have a common language with which to speak to other healthcare yeah. professionals either, and they won't take you seriously. So if as i think i said before you know you you're working with someone and you suspect in order to carry on that work at, at any in any meaningful way that they might need say a minor tranquilizer for a very short period of time you've got to be able to go to say the doctor in the practice or or whoever and to be able to justify that to them on their terms not on your terms but in a way that they understand so you get the cooperation and I, I think that's incredibly important. Otherwise, again, you, you're working in a vacuum. And no, no, no one works in a vacuum really or lives in a vacuum. So th that, is, that has been absolutely crucial, hasn't mm -hmm. it, to our practice. And, and when we've trained people uh, or continue to train people, we always emphasize the fact that they need to not just learn about psychopathology, but they need to understand about physical pathology yeah. as well and what can go wrong in the body. Uh, but also about medicine and the medicines that are out there and what doctors uh, and other healthcare workers are likely to be prescribing. So it has to be a complete package. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Just just very quickly on something that you were saying, Steve, about, and I think about five minutes ago or, or so, you're discussing um, uh, sometimes a symbol is too powerful or there's, there's something there within the unconscious that's too powerful that you can't then bring to consciousness. Yeah. This are there any examples that you could give on that? Because that would be an interesting thing to cover, I think. From what I understand, potentially what this could be, something I've, I've thought about doing things as well as I start to help people on my own journey to becoming a psychotherapist, I notice that I can spot things quite quickly, for example. And mm -hmm. so I guess the, the psychically most hygienic way of going about doing this is to not basically go, here's everything that type of thing, reveal absolutely everything to somebody. Would that be classed in the same category of not bringing everything to consciousness all at once or even at all? Yeah, I mean, um, Jung talked, for example, about latent psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, under normal pressures, uh, an individual may not become psychotic, for example. Mm. But if, uh, like Virgil, if you stir up the underworld, you know, you've got to be careful about what might come up. It might not be what you asked for. Um, so there's always that in, in the background. I always try to bear in mind that the psyche intends to remain in balance, and it will have its operating tolerances. Uh, sometimes, though, they fail naturally, if you like, un under pressure. But if, if you add a variable to that where you, mm. you push it too far, mm. um, an everyday example might be that somebody might ingest a, stu a substance of some kind, yes, and then open the doors of Aldous Huxley's perception to something not very nice yes you know and then they can't put the genie back in the no. bottle no. because this stuff becomes associated to the ego and identified with and we've, we've discussed this this before so yeah there's there's a natural way of, of taking a hint from the unconscious and then you ha the other problem is um if you don't take that hint the other problem is you take something and it just blows the you know the closed door in your mind off its hinges to quote uh, to quote somebody, mm. uh, and uh, that that can cause uh, serious problems of itself. The other thing that can happen is that if you access the self mm. in the wrong way, if you if you think about it, the um, the self right, and this uh, a number of people have taken issue with what I've said here, and I, I go back to Anthony Stevens on this, and it is absolutely obvious. The, uh, the self, if it is anything, is not a psychological experience of itself because you cannot experience it. Even Jung said that you, you, you cannot experience yourself. It is too big. And that's only at a psychological level. 
well, what is the self? Well, it's either some kind of Cartesian separate substance or it represents the totality of you as a biological entity, which includes the lifespan development, release of your psychology as a potential and your psychosocial development from itself as a genome. How on earth can you actualize the entire genome? Well, you can't. So this is why the self ultimately will turn up not as a character or as a figure, whether it's the wise old man or the wise old woman or any of these other cultural representations of things, it turns up, as Jung himself said, principally as a geometric image. Mm. Because that just about sums up the fact that it has to be experienced as an abstraction. You cannot experience it, certainly not as another human being. If you experience the self archetype or you, you excuse the expression, self-identify the self archetype as a figure, then what you're doing really is experiencing the ego in an enlarged representational form. It's not the true self. And that, that is controversial, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to take issue with that. And I'm afraid I'm going to get a bit rude here and say you need the experience to understand the you difference between the geometric representation of a totality you just simply cannot experience and then a projected individual personal character. There's so many orders of magnitude difference between the two mm. and the experience of the self as a geometric uh, figure or configuration is a safety valve experience of, of uh, mm. the self as a genomic totality as a figure as a, as a personified human figure is an ego fiction it is not the reality of itself it's projecting the trajectory potentially of the ego to personally individuate but when you individuate you cannot you simply cannot access the entire genome it is not possible you can only become what you can become within the tolerances mm. that are given to you yeah. biologically. Mm. That, that, that's, the, that's the safety limit. Mm. So I'm sorry if that's going to upset a lot of people, but if someone can't see that, then very, very politely, I would say you need more experience. Yeah. Well, on, on the idea of the self, so I've been thinking a lot about this because it is quite a confusing thing because we won't we don't know the biological origins of the self i don't think those symbols purely on a, on a hypothesis level say the the mandala or the circle or, or the, the rounded square and all the other classic symbols i don't think that would be of the self itself because if you think about it biologically you've got lots of chromosomes sitting there yes. you know you, you've got two you know 23 chromosomes and then a pair of them each how these are all going to coordinate with one another to produce an image i had absolutely no idea so it would, it would, instead of the self, I think it would have to be, for what it's worth, something like the process of you becoming closer to the self. And so that process of you moving along that ego self axis, if you like, or information exchange produces the image exactly. rather than the actual that's, thing itself. That's, what, that's exactly what I meant. You, 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 you've, you've presented it in a much clearer way than I did. But that is exactly what I meant. You cannot ex access something which is far too big. And it is not psychological. So much as you, as you rightly say of the genome is not psychological. It's not meant to be psychological because we are not only psychology. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only way it could be, as far as I can tell anyway. And I was, I was reminded as well when you're talking about the, the, the biopsychosocial model and how you shouldn't be reductive at any one level. It reminds mm. me of when I had my um, my proper dissociative anxiety a few, a few months ago now, end of 2019. Mm. And I went into the to the doctors and I know the doctors, they work very, very hard. You know, they, they, they keep the NHS going, which is a current meme at, at the moment. So I do appreciate them. But his advice for my anxiety, first of all, he laughed at the fact I mentioned myths, which is kind of a... Yes. It kind of shows a disconnect. He says, what do you do all day? What's, what are your interests? He was just gaining rapport or something like that, yeah. I guess. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm into Carl Jung. I'm into mythology. He's like, mm. you... And he, he, he mean you kind of have, you know, you've taken about like, it. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he was almost concerned with the fact that I'd even mentioned yeah. myths yeah. because he's like, so you've come in saying you feel like you're living in a dream, and now you're talking yeah. about yes, yeah, yeah. Before so, you're so you're being okay. sectioned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and, and, and then yeah. I said, uh, how? So how can I get rid of this anxiety? And he said, oh, stop smoking. And I was like, no. He was like, stop like, smoking. I was like, no, yeah. that's the only thing that keeps the anxiety yeah, away. Why would I stop down. smoking? Yeah. So I came out immediately and like lit three cigarettes, just like one <laughs> after the other. And was like, get out of my face. I was like, it's like, it, it, and I know he, he was an overworked in, in, individual. He sees these things all the time, but it goes to show it's like he was wrong. Like, it's no excuse like, you, for you, ignorance, you, you, is it? Yeah, you, you have to have the different fields talking to each other, Rachel, not going to get you to do. a solution, you, which you is why I, I, I do support the model that you two have worked on over the course of your careers. Cause it's, it it's doesn't work. mean that you don't despair over their reactions to things. 
Sure, sure. I, I walked out and was like, well, that was really disappointing. Yes, it is disappointing. Well, it shows the limits of his development, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, no, have, uh, but because we work, you know, in a culture that by and large is like that, we have to accommodate it. The main thing is, I guess, that you get what you need out of that. If, if it's a, a therapist uh, rather than, say, yourself and your relationship to your own GP, you have to try and get what you can from that person to assist the patient that you're working with as, as, you, as best you can. Well, it is. It is if, if, if that person, you know, that doctor or whoever is not into developing themselves any further, yeah. then you are limited by that. Yeah, I mean, just out of, about the, um, the concern he would have had about myth, it, mm. that really just reflects the fact that sadly mm -hmm. psychiatric units are yes. full of living myths. Yes. And that the, 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 as Jung observed, he was certainly one of the first, along with uh, Franz Ricklin and others who worked with him, and Pierre Janet, his teacher, mm. and Eugen Bloiler, who was his his boss at the Berg Holstey, had all witnessed this, that the contents of uh, psychiatric symptoms, particularly when they're unbuffered and in the raw, mm. are exactly the same yes. as what you get in myths yes. and in dreams and, and so forth. So they are going to be suspicious of them. Yeah, and they will. to be quite honest with you, rightly so, because if they're to the fore, that means that the normal, healthy, adapted ego, ego, has gone yes in effect uh, and it is dangerous mm. it can be very very dangerous and uh, when i was saying about accessing things that you can't contain you have to be careful and the psyche very often will produce a symbol to contain those forces before it reaches consciousness that's health that, that that's uh, that, mm. that's doing it the healthy way mm. and of course uh, projecting into films like star wars or star trek or whatever star whatever uh, that's healthy too to to an extent you know, to an extent. Mm. It, it depends how far you identify with it and then what pressure you put under mm. um, and how a person then fractures. Very often people fracture psychotically according to their interests and their beliefs. So if they'd been into the occult, for example, before the psychotic episode, then it's occult forces that come for them. Yes. If, if uh, they're in, and forgive me for saying this, believing Christians out there, I, I respect all of you, don't worry. If you're into that and then you do fracture psychotically, then I'm afraid it's Satan who's coming for you. Yeah? Because your belief system has produced that as a problem, yeah. and therefore it'll, it's, it'll come for you. If you're a Hindu, it's different. If you're a Buddhist, it's different. If you're an atheist, it's different. But it will feed on these elements that you are used to connecting to. This is why your personal myth is important. What you attach to your personal myth can heal you or it can harm you depending how much pressure you put somebody under. Yes, I've, um, I did experience, and people know this about my own, um, I, I was technically hospitalized for a psychotic episode, but I, don't, I just the nomenclature at that point doesn't matter. Basically, I was not myself. I yeah. just put it like that for about two hours. And mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, Steve, when, when you're saying like what you attach to your own personal myth. Because the words that I was... And I, I, at the time, I didn't actually have the proper psychological nomenclature through which to describe what I experienced. Mm -hmm. I presumed it was something like the collective unconscious rushing through to me. But looking back on it, I was like, actually, this is all just stuff I was interested in. So yeah. the actual, the, actual mm -hmm. um, the, the, the characteristics of what I was doing was basically in Dante's hell. That's how it manifested. Yes. I, yeah. I was stuck doing the same action, which was trying to run away over and over and over again for what felt like eternity. That's the definition of Dante's hell. Yeah. And I was, I, was, I was literally screaming on the floor, Carl Jung quotes, for example. Yeah. And I come away going, oh, I've, I've, I'd never thought I'd been enlightened. I never reached that point being like, oh, I, I've, I'm enlightened. I've encountered something greater than myself. But it's like, no, you, you've just encountered your own personal complexes. You've encountered yeah. the things which you have attached to your own myth, voluntarily or involuntarily, that's going to actually stop you individuating. It's just going to sort of keep you contained. So yeah, I've had I've, I've had first-hand experience with that. I love I love Dante. I really do. But he wasn't yeah. you know the healthiest thing to encounter when you ingest too much marijuana at once. <laughs> oh, kind of just interject. I'm I'm sorry. I know I've, I've uh, spoken a lot, but that's very very helpful mm. uh, because uh, young psychiatric experience at the Burke Holsley with people who were psychotic. What's forgotten now is because when people think of Carl Jung, they, they straight away jump on onto archetypes. Again, I'm afraid, frankly, yawn, boring. Why are you trying to start where he finished? You don't understand the man unless you know his journey. And what he said, quite clearly, as to the team he was working with, yes, it was a team, included uh, 
Franz Recklin, his very close friend, after whom his son was named, Franz Jung, by the way, they said that, that the contents of the psychoses were complexes, not archetypes. They showed archetypal material in the sense that they were collective, but the way that they manifested for individuals were, were through the form principally of, of personal complexes. Then very occasionally, when you get really down to the, 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 the bottom level of the dissociation that would occur, for example, in, in someone suffering from schizophrenia uh, or dementia precox, as they called it at that time, you would get um, a symbol which could be called religious or could be something which the person couldn't have known about that you could only find in a specialist book or at least appeared to be that way. And that suggested that it was another common layer to the psyche. But the thing is, how do these images form? And again, I feel and think, both of them, uh, not at odds with one another, thinking and feeling, they're both in agreement. Um, how do these images form? People forget, again, with Carl Jung, and say that the primordial image is the archetype, as if it's only innate and only born from that. And he's defining that as being an archetype. Well, Jung was also heavily influenced by a sociologist, Emile Durkheim, who talked about collective representations, yeah? And also by Claude Levy Brill, who was an anthropologist, who also talked along with uh, Durkheim, he, he, he followed Durkheim, about collective representations. In other words, mythic images are created by culture and are then literally ingested, interjected into the psyche, they believed. That's as far as they went. But Jung was interested in how that might interface with something that was already there. So you get then a resultant image, which is a collision between a cultural process, acquired, learned, i.e. a complex, and then some other way of making sense of that experience. And then you get a kind of a blend, a syncretism of the two, which I call the resultant image, because it results from the interaction of the two. And then you also get another misunderstanding about instincts. People think instincts are blind and autonomous. It's, it, it's like it has no vision, it has no nothing. You know, but instincts, as they're understood now, are completely different because they are whole situations and anticipations. They are reactions, yes, but, but, but they also anticipate, as I say, situations and therefore release behaviours ahead of those situations happening. And they contain, because they're entire situations, an image, a narrative. You see this in the play of animals. You see it in birds building nests. You'll see it in lion cubs rehearsing, taking down prey that they've never encountered because the image of the prey is within them and the, the activity of, of predation is within them. So they already have these primordial images, but they are not archetypes as such. They are instincts. So we should think then that just as Jung said, behind a complex, there is always an archetype. Behind a so-called archetype, it's always an instinct or more than one instinct. And then there's a process by which an external situation and an internal situation meet to activate a whole series of instincts, whole series of related archetypes and their resultant images, and then complexes and then actionable behavior. And this occurs simultaneously at several levels and they all feed into one another. So it's, it's not just that we have a primordial image as some kind of spirit or ghost in the machine that is an archetype. That, that is to deny biology and deny the fact that biology comes first. So if archetypes are real, they must be on an instinctive base. They must be connected to instincts. And there are several youngings who have switched on to this. The author of Women Who Runs With The Wolves. Oh, yes. Um, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's laced throughout his book. It's like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's a fantastic journey for women mm. to, to understand their instincts yes. and that the archetypes are laid on top of them. She understands that if you she lose does. contact with instincts, you're screwed, mm. you're finished. Mm. You can have all the archetypal fantasies you like and it won't get you out of the mess that you're in. And that lifespan and individuation are primarily driven genetically, released through instincts. Archetypes then form on the basis of the instinct and the basis of exter external experience. And then you get your human, normal, adaptive yeah. personality of all your complexes clustered around that. It's a simple stack, mm. but it's not a case of really of thinking in a reductive sense of which one's more important. They're all important and they all interact. And if you work psychotherapeutically in depth, you will find the reality of this. It's not about theory. And if you use creative therapies, you will certainly access it. Well, to be creative is an instinct. 
Bang. Well, she would she would say that for us, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on a roll again. I beg <laughs> your pardon. <laughs> oh, oh, so but, but it is. Yeah. Almost enough said, really. Right, well, yes, I, yeah. I, I, as usual, calling just <laughs> with an in, introverted sensing and extroverted feeling just cuts to the quick and shuts up my intuitively <clears throat> extroverted, intuitively powered. But big, big introverted thing. <laughs> being creative again, it, you don't have to limit it to you know. The, the the drawing the painting no. the, the the writing or whatever you can be creative in so many ways can't you, you and, can. uh, yeah. even if it's just to do with your your ingenuity your ingenuity in a particular situation uh anything really can can come under that umbrella mm. that means yeah. that you're you know responding um and adapting to something in a way that is protective of you which of course is you know to want to protect yourself and and, and um, the way you live in your environment and so on is an instinctive reaction yeah this comes off the off the heels of the last videos that we were doing on, yes, on the, red, the, the red shoes yes, I think it, it was I think it was something you said Pauline actually was um, uh, you know your, your positive libido is your creativity yeah. so yeah. Kind of like the, the marker by which you can become a more well adapted person yeah. generally yeah. speaking is probably going to be your creativity and, and it, which doesn't have to be reduced because when I read things like painting and dance and movement and yes. sculpture for example I know yes. these like thera therapeutic tools yes. I immediately go like eh, no yeah, eh. it's a bit I did, limiting isn't it really yeah yeah it's just never been a thing i did try free drawing recently and that that was quite an interesting thing um yeah. you know another know things like automatic writing i did like an automatic drawing yeah. thing i you know relaxed myself was in like a little bit a little bit of a trance and was started drawing stuff and the images yeah. that came up were like that's that's kind of really really interesting i wonder what they mean but it was more of a cathartic thing to be honest mm -hmm. than anything else and it's something you said as well pauline at the beginning was it doesn't have to be good either which is something that uh, really, really matters to myself because I, I cannot draw to save my life whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but on the, on, on the back end of, you know, we've done, uh, I guess we've covered the more hygienic stuff and more therapeutic stuff. But I'd be really interested, honestly, in both of your creative processes because you're both creative in different ways and it both, you know, it's a way for you to express yourselves positively and you both really enjoy it and the work you, you produce are both mm. really, really good. So I think it'd be nice to hear for both of you actually what, what what that's like for you what your creativity manifests as and how you go about doing yeah. it gosh where to start with <laughs> where to start with that one um well like i say i don't i probably wouldn't want to just limit it to the drawing and the painting that i do because for, for me it could be anything any kind of creative en endeavor uh, anything that that you know someone would think of as being enriching um so i mean i could give a, a couple of i guess a very different examples i mean i've been working on a little project for our daughter which is to try and um build her a wardrobe basically out of a of a pre-existing cupboard well i would i would consider that a creative endeavor i mean i'm you know it's not something that i would say um, I mean, I'm not sort of like a, an incredible sort of handy person or handyman, whatever you want. <laughs> um, but I can do, but I can do a, a few basic things, and um, there's room for improvement. But I would get a lot of satisfaction out of doing something like that, um, and you know, it's a very, it's a very practical thing to do. But it's still a, a creative endeavour. So I kind of think of that on the one hand to something that would, which would require um, much more focus, uh, such as the drawing I do. But it, it, it's in a context because it's in the context of the of, of Steve's screenplays and um, the films that will will flow from that. So um, I kind of have a brief to work to in a way don't i and, and we kind of confer yeah, on that yeah, and yeah yeah i mean um i, th I think there's probably a, a difference between the, the kind of productive uh, i mean she's very good at diy honestly she is she really is anything like that pauline can turn her hands to it and does and engages with it fully uh and, but i think there's a difference between that and creativity per se mm. the form is probably just the engagement of her personality and her nature with yes. the world. Yeah. And, and mm. there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a, an entirely good thing. Uh, but creativity, which is the generation of something new, uh, by my own personal uh, interpretation, yes. by engagement with the psyche, is different. 
Um, it may be a band width, it may not be that they're completely different things in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can tell when she's when when she's drawing, she's not a normal self, shall we say, you know, she's a she's in a different frame of mind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, please, yeah, please carry on. No, you're all right. Um, one has to make oneself scared <laughs> and um, walk around with you know, wads of cotton wool under your feet and, and, and so forth. And if you make a noise, cotton wool under your ears. <laughs> It depends at what stage I'm at with the process, oh, yeah. to, to be fair, I think, yeah. because, um, I, yeah, the, some elements of that are true. I think, I think probably, um, I think literally at the inception, at the, at the very start, when I'm kind of laying things out and, and accuracy is important to me, to be disturbed at that stage it would be detrimental to the rest of it probably so so long as i have some some quiet and some real focus then by the time i've got it got things mapped out i can relax more um once the thing is actually underway so i would agree with that in the past but maybe just not around at, at the point at which things are, are going swimmingly in yeah, there. Well, <laughs> the way i look at it is that if you're at the center of an explosion and it blows away from you well yeah. rather like farting you know <laughs> To, to receive a fart is far more offensive than to generate one. <laughs> so, so in that sense, if you obsess her when she's uh, she's drawing, then you receive a fart. Lovely. That's that very, very wise <laughs> words there. I enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I ask on? Um, we were talking about this recently, Steve, just off air about flow states, stuff like that. We we're kind of with like potential models of what a flow state might be. I'm interested the typological differences if, if, if you like yeah. between what like a flow state is so when you're drawing or you're doing your art or the, mm. the different things that, you, that you're doing poorly mm. um are you in what we would colloquially define as a flow state if you're familiar with the term that pauline or yeah yeah pauline well, I'm, not familiar, I'm not familiar with the term flow state but um okay. I can maybe sort of imagine what you might mean by that um it's, 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 it's as if you're you're, you're not you're not aware of time anymore. Oh, like definitely. The simplest definition. Oh, absolutely. That that's so true because sometimes you're so absorbed in it, and Steve will say to me, "It's half twelve at night," you know, and I'm thinking, "What?" Yeah. And, yeah. and and I've sat down, say, and, to and, do and something. She promised. And she promised that today <laughs> she would cook tea, and the whole family starving. <laughs> that's one thing that never happens actually, because I, I make sure that. I oh, it does happen. Time. It has happened. Not often, but it has happened. Very, no. very rare. Because it's so rare. It's so <laughs> Hurtful, oh. but it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! What are you like? You get used to you get used to being abused, but, but if it happens frequently, but if it's in frequency, it hurts. It hurts so terribly. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Well, to come back to the flow state, definitely, I, I can definitely identify with that, James. And 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 the, you know, it's as if the passage of time just. Uh, you know you're not aware of it you're totally absorbed in what you're doing yeah. um hmm. yeah 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 definitely definitely and, and is there a way for you to get yourself into a state like that or is it literally like art you know it's like there, there's, there's an unconscious resonance with you and you're like yes and then you get into it straight away i think it's it's easier once I've actually, once everything is laid out and like I, I said before, sort of the, the need for, for focus and sort of uh, that early attention that's required in, in order for what comes after that to, to, hmm. to work well. Um, that is usually when I'm lost in it. it it's usually been beyond that initial, right, this is what I'm, I'm going to set out to do and this is how I'm going to sort of organise the, the drawing or the painting. It, it comes later in the process probably mm. okay okay because uh, you know you, you bec- i think i'm probably more relaxed at that point and if you're more relaxed you're more likely to be absorbed in it yeah it's it's, it's interesting i only bring this up just because of the things steve and i were, we were discussing yeah. that a flow state could perhaps be related to um, extroverted intuition which you would right. uh, which you would have and that be under the domain of your animus presumably anyway i don't know if that changes the more individuated you are as you as you go along and i only ask because i'm like constantly in a flow state and yeah. i only realized this wasn't a normal thing quote unquote i'm not saying it's a good thing or a virtuous thing it's just like a yes there's no buffer time for me to, for time to disappear 
none. Well, so, it... like, for example, while we're recording now, I have to monitor the actual time that we've gone recording yes. or else I just will not pay any kind of attention. And that yeah. happens immediately. So, yeah. I wonder if, you know, if there's any kind of differences there, if we could find a typological basis for it. Because that's generally my creative process when it comes to things. It's literally just automatic engagement with something. And it could well, just could be overwrapped the, any. The, the, the type simply expresses something. And if we focus on the type, then we miss the underlying process, which is common. Uh, and collective and in mm. that sense uh independent. Stand outside of, yeah, yeah it's in, 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 independent it's, 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 it, might, it might be independent mm. it's just the, it's just that's what we notice mm. or what other people notice that it's expressed through our type but the, mm. the creative process itself is independent of it and to be honest uh uh typism is a kind of typological reductionism for me typology starts to run out very very quickly once you in terms of explaining people and, and particularly with creativity or even with neurosis or, or, or anything like that after just a few steps into the reality of another person typology starts to lose its explanatory power unless you've ingested that as uh, you know automatic thoughts yourself and you start to think and interpret everything in that way mm. but but if you just look at people who know nothing about type who aren't concerned about it they do things naturally yeah yeah i'm wondering in terms of type yeah. purely in terms of you know there is the way it manifests but then there's also so for example the way i understand your artwork and even things doing with with your hands like you're building mm. your wardrobe and all mm. things like that you're, you're using your hands there's great attention to detail being there there's there's kind of a, a sensuality present in what you're you're doing in particular the work that you're doing i know it is it's incredibly detailed i'll put it up mm. over the screen as, as, as i've done before whereas yeah. and so that could be introverted sensing it could, or something yeah. like 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 it that could. Where, whereas mine is usually like bang i'm just like sucked out to something yeah. and i just get stuck stuck out in the object yes it's lit so yeah. I, I was i don't know if i've said it on a podcast yet but it's just an interesting observation like yeah. when i'm looking at my computer screen right now i can't mm -hmm. see the computer screen and jane was saying that's weird i yeah. always see the, the computer screen i'm like yeah. ah i'm in the screen you're in your body that's yeah. kind of a difference in in yeah. how we yeah. how we see the world which is a really kind of i, I don't know if the, you, you guys watching if you experience the same thing or not i know most guys mm -hmm. tend to be intuitive types rather than others so i wonder which one they kind of generally that's more resonate with mm. but I yeah think, it's, it, i think it's, that's interesting because um i've uh, i've looked at information processing um quite closely over the years it, in a different context also all together to this and i've uh I've come to some conclusions based on research about that that would probably contradict what I've just said, which is interesting to me. It, insofar as type probably is important, at least the way that our model information processing does, uh, does, does data driven, which is obviously sensing. Yes. And then there's hypothesis driven information processing, which is obviously intuition. Mm. Um, and I've looked at that in terms of uh, the distinction between fighter aces and World War II. That was very early stuff that was done on, on information processing psychology. And um, I've looked at it with what makes uh, a Formula One driver better than the others. Um, and I've also looked at it in terms of uh, martial arts and in terms of um, combat sports, that kind of thing. Is there a particular kind of... Uh, modeling and processing of information that is more effective than another and I've published on this um, and that, 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 that research went on for over 20 years and yes even though uh, I did look at intuition and sensing and, and various other Jungian psychodynamics with that when it comes to specifically to a creative activity mm. it, feel, it feels different to me and that might be because it's accessing the flow state that you're talking about mm. i'm aware of the the use of the term uh i'm wary of it because it's a little bit um of a cliche and yeah. I, would, I would rather have experience of something than merely the idea via proxy of what something is supposed to be before I make any kind of uh, judgments about it. But th that certainly made me think. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, no, it's just, just yeah. You know, I'm obviously using flow state colloquially. It's like, I wonder, wonder how it relates to the creative process. It's, it's considered in lots of self-development circles to be a sort of like a Holy grail. And there mm. are ways, you know, I know there have been books written. It's like how you can maximize your time in flow states. Mm. So it's just kind of something that interests me. Yeah. Well, my, my personal understanding of it is that it's a, it's a dissociative state where there is a suppression of consciousness of the normal ego and the normal egos uh, or ego some people don't like me saying ego yeah uh, the normal egos um preoccupations and attentions yeah but it is systematized whereas if you go off into a reverie it's unsystematized that's what a reverie is 
Mm. But if you're in a creative state of dissociation and you're definitely engaged with a systematic process of producing something mm. that's outside of your normal conscious awareness, and that's where it gets really interesting for me, theoretically and also experientially, because that is a different state to be in. Now, mm. others may describe that as being flow state, and I could live with that, you know, if, if as long as I understand what they mean is the same mm. as what I'm actually experiencing. Mm. Mm. Well, okay, okay. Um, and I'm wondering, Pauline, as well, on, mm. on the, the artwork stuff that yes. you do, it's um, what, the, what the process is, or if it's just purely unconscious, as to which, which images you might choose to, 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 to draw and you know play with basically mm. so i know a lot of the ones at least the ones that have been sent over to me and ones i've shown in, in the past yes. have been based on um the the screenplays that, that steve has been writing yes so is there is there some is there a resonance there maybe a field phenomenon between the two of you that draws you into that particular world if, if you see what i mean so it looks like it looks like it's unconsciously focused Mm. If, if, if you see what I mean, it's not necessarily unless you do separately. I'm going to just draw to be creative. It's like draw to be creative mm. towards a higher project goal, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Is there I anything that goes on on that side of stuff? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, James. I think some of the early stuff I did was was probably, again, looking back now, just a almost a technical exercise. Because I guess in, in my own mind, I wanted to try and hone my own technical ability to a point where I could then give better expression to unconscious things. So the, the early stuff was probably more like that. But the stuff that I've, I've engaged with, with, with Steve, I, I agree with you. I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a combination of, I guess, of our creative forces are coming together of them. And I kind of, I guess I kind of know where Steve's coming from and, and, and what he wants to explicate visually. Uh, and I feel I want to do my very best to, to produce something which will um, sum that up for him. Yeah, well, you do. Um, yes, she does. So she absolutely does. Yeah. I, I, think it, I think it's important for it to be something that you want to do, something that you feel has some inherent value. And isn't just a technical exercise, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, yeah. because that in and of itself can just start to feel as dry as dust, really. Um, so if I know what it is that, that Steve wants to to express visually through through a visual medium, uh, that's far more exciting. Uh, and it, it, it's um, it makes me want to work at it harder than if I was just to say, you know, take any old image of, I don't know, uh, a celebrity image, for example, and decide I want to reproduce that as, as technically accurately as I can. I mean, that, that's, you reach a point where that doesn't really do much for you anymore. Yeah. Oh, can I offer a, yes, from, of course. from the, the yeah. consumer side, if you yeah. like, of Pauline's artwork? Just to, just to be clear, um, th these films are real. Uh, and they do involve Hollywood directors and producers and, and all sorts and they are big projects there's a lot of them and that's why it's slow because the bigger something like this is the more inertia there is um, so that just 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 to be clear on that you know um, we're on IMDB for example and we can we can be checked out there on that but with respect to the creativity when I've worked with other artists fine artists then my approach has been to not interfere, not that I've interfered with Pauline, I don't, but not interfere with them, even though they're not connected to me. Yes. And it would just be a case of whatever you produce is valid because I believe that we're both accessing something that's deep and complementary. And it's the same with musicians. I've worked with, with lots, some of them very famous musicians, certainly from the past, but are still working now. Um, I just let them do it. Mm -hmm. but I do have to pick the person and I do have to have confidence in them that they're going to produce a really good soundtrack. Uh, and, you know, music can, can paint with emotion very, very effectively. So let, let, let that run. The difference is mm -hmm. that I, I, I'm not with them. I, I don't live with them. I don't no. interact with them and they don't know me. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the distinction I, I'm, I'm trying to, to make with Pauline because she's so intimately involved with me psychologically and she knows me better than anyone and has done uh, for so many decades now. Um, 
the, the, the trust and the involvement between us is very, very deep. And I know that what she produces is an exact resonance emotionally with what we're both accessing. And it really, really does support what I do. Um, she, she sums up the character, the characterization as I experience it internally in an external visual way. Um, that, that's the, the best way that, that, that I can look at it. It's taught me a lot writing like this because I have a completely different perspective now on what archetypes are than I did have. Um, my understanding of them initially was as an intellectual level by reading Jung, and I'm going back to the early 70s, early 1970s, and that was great at a theoretical level, and I could apparently apply those ideas to my own development and then start to, to apply them to the developments of, of other people. The problem with it came when they produced material themselves spontaneously from within. And then I realized that my understanding was, li was limited and I had to dig really deep into Jung's actual process. He contradicts himself all the time. You know, you really do have to go through the labyrinth with him to, to, to find out what he means and when he meant it and when he revised those ideas. But he said, and he's absolutely right, that the living truth of another human being is the absolute arbiter of what's really going on and you set aside all, all theories and then you experience it. And then when you turn that inside yourself and you access the creative process internally, then it really put the icing on the cake for me. I'd gone through a journey of uh, realizing the biological truth of things through Anthony Stevens' work in particular, but also earlier than him through the Dialectics of Biology group and they were massively influential on me. Apart from their political ideas, they were all very, very extreme left wing, Nothing to do with that. I was interested in the way that they constructed their understanding of the different disciplines and how they interact and the limitations that we all impose on one another by narrowing things down to one level of analysis, description and explanation. But when it came to encountering things in the raw in this way, as opposed to simply dreams or active imagination or working with another person but working on yourself in that way where these narratives spontaneously appear and the characters take on a life apparently of their own and start to write the bloody stuff themselves and that your ego personality gets in the way and that they're massively massively connected to emotion and that emotion and the narratives themselves, which do follow a collective uh, uh, form, because you can see the same thing coming through, mm. are rooted in instincts. And this is a challenge that I, that I would offer anybody. If you interpret a dream, yeah, do it at the archetypal level. Do it at the level of personal complexes. And once you've done that, revisit it again. And this time, ask yourself, what instincts are being acted out here? And I don't mean blind instincts. Instincts are not blind, anything other than blind. If they were, they would be of no use at all for survival or adaptation. Mm -hmm. But what, what instincts are motivating the characters? And as soon as you get that, you know where the archetypes come from. And you understand by uh, writing novels, screenplays and so on, and then by watching films, that the archetypes themselves are actually the narratives. And the narratives are the things that are anticipated instinctively and in the genome. And Pauline put it well the other day. She said, imagine if you were, you were you know, producing a film and you, you hired a boatload of actors, a cast of thousands. And they said, great, where's the script? We haven't got a script, we've got the actors. The actors are the archetypes. Yeah. There's no effing story. Therefore, <laughs> there is no script. There is no film. There is no narrative. No, there is no context. Mm. You know? mm. and, and that really reduces it down. Mm. And then it becomes clear. Just as with myths, have a narrative and have a proper structure that is anticipated because it shows lifespan development issues. You know, the characters develop, they have to evolve and they have goals. All of those goals are instinctive. Yeah. The unfolding of, of, of your life yeah, is directed by your genome instinctively. And the archetypes as we experience them, which is only as images in a narrative form, are probably something that we haven't really looked at properly. And the, the, the way they're generally looked at now is more of a fantasy, more of a fiction, a projection and an identification of our own ego consciousness into a narrative, yeah, which is normal enough, but it's not to understand the thing in itself. So when I write, 
I um, go into what you probably call a flow state because uh, I access an emotional and affect bridge first of all because that's the clearest way to, to snap yourself out of whatever state you're in is to access an emotion. Remember, emotions are primordial and they're always related to instincts, whether that instinct is gratification or whether that instinct is something that you plan and that you want to go for, you feel that drive, or whether it's bonding socially and it's oxytocin, you know, it's, it's at that level, but it's still an instinct. And all the characters have that in mind, that they have a goal and they are directed to doing something. So if you just tone your, your, your ego consciousness, your ego down, they'll come through and they'll tell you. And I've had that experience whereby, I mean, the very first one I did, which was, which, which was connected to my own personal myth. I mean, most of you know that I, I served in the police and um, it took me a long time to leave. It took me decades after I'd left to leave. Mm -hmm. I possibly you, still yes, have You're still leaving. Steve. Still leaving. Um, <laughs> but I did get an attenuation. You know of the uh, the psychic response to being <clears throat> trapped prisoner like in that job um, by writing um, that, that 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 caused a break and what I did I wrote uh, and self-published it's gone now I've taken it off because it's done its job uh, an autobiography um, but this, this was an autobiography in the 1990s so it'd be well out of date now anyway but that immediately caused a, a reduction in this backlog of material and that left a bit of a gap. So I thought, oh, you know, I, I, I promised some of my colleagues back in 1977 that one day I would write an English version of the American novel, The Choir Boys, because I'd read The Choir Boys, we all had. And uh, just like any adoption of a cultural myth, these lads thought that they were the UK version of The Choir Boys. Well, actually, they already were. So they were just finding a confirmation of the fact that they were. But I thought there's such a, an odd bunch of, of characters here. One day I'll write that. So he laughed at me and said, oh, that'll never happen, you know. Well, uh, yeah, 30 years later it did. Uh, but it didn't survive the first page. Something came through and I decided to go with it. And that went to a very strange place. Uh, and I realised that this was outside of me and it was outside even of my personal myth or of my personal complexes or anything. This was coming through. And I thought, I've just got to go with this. I, I went down and I said to Paul, Paul, I've got to do this. I have to do it and I can't stop. And I didn't stop. And I think I wrote, um, it was at least nine vol nine novels back to back. You did, yeah. In about six, six or seven months. And I uh, got in touch with a BBC producer through someone. That's a, that's a very funny story in a way how that happened, but I won't sidetrack into it. That was a, a, a crazy a bunch of misunderstandings and synchronicities. Mm -hmm. But he was very helpful to me very helpful in many ways but one thing he said is can you write something other than this and i thought i have no idea i'll ask <laughs> so i had to go i had to go back to where i'd written the the original trilogy of novels which was my exorcism except that it took itself over and, and became itself and then this other thing came through and uh i said to paul uh, paul you know, I, this is this is a film I, I, I didn't intend it, but I feel this is a film. And believe it or not, it was picked up. And then, you know, now 23 scripts later, uh, they're all spinning around there. And uh, there's a hell of a lot of interest in, in them. And other people are sending us their film projects. We, 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 we've got um, collaborators in Germany. We've got a games company involved. We've got Hollywood directors. We've got all sorts of people. Uh, we're also uh, developing a film school. Um, universities are, are collaborating with us as well on that and we're, we're reaching out for community outreach and, and, and hoping to build up employment for people in the creative industries but all the projects are young yin and I realize that that's been why it's worked that um, my experience of, of young yin psychology and working on myself allowed that door to be opened in such a way that the material from the psyche could come through in a way that I could understand and give some mediumistic if you like expression to but the thing with paul is that she's on the journey with me and that she can do things i can't do and she can also get inside the narrative as it's being written and act as if you like a kind of a sounding board but it's more than that it's much more intimate than that um without a doubt i i use my relationship to pauline to personify the anima internally 
and uh, it's through that that I access things more consciously until they just take over themselves. That's part of the emotional bridge uh, for the connection. Um, so you're probably getting an idea from that that, that, that for someone like me, it's um, it's quite an involved process because I tend to try to analyze things because you do when, when, when you've had this. And that creates what I was saying before about the inertia, the resistance of the material is that if I try and do that, then this thing will kick against me and it will say, no, you're not going to do it. Like you're not, no, 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 no. You know, it's like the characters there and he or she will say, no, I wouldn't do that. I'd do this. And if I don't go along with it, then you get a writer's block and you realize that there is something which is bigger than your ego, which is say, which is directing the process. Mm. And the only way I can get around that once it's separated from me is I need the affect bridge. So I need to talk to Paul and Pauline will, will, will work on me on, on what the emotional state was, what the characters are, who they are, how they're interacting. Uh, and I have to feel it. I, I, I then get into a state where this is what I call myself a method writer. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a female character, a male character, or even an animal, mm. you know, um, I have to feel it. I have to feel what they're going through. Uh, if I feel that, I'm in touch with my instincts. If, if I'm in touch with the instincts that are coming through, the archetypes just appear. Mm. But if you're not there with the instincts, the archetypes are just flat. You know, they, they get pulled in as cultural things, other people's creations. And it's not a natural spontaneity that comes from within the psyche. Mm. And I do believe that the reason that, that my scripts have appealed to, to the people who they have appealed to, which includes some top, top notch actors, quality actors, is and, and this is in spite of the fact that I don't do anything in an orthodox way. I'm a self-trained um, uh, writer. <laughs> I've done everything wrong, yeah. everything yeah. wrong. But what they like or seem to resonate with is the emotion, the connection to instinct, the connection to a worked through narrative and a proper um, mythic process. Um, but you can only do that if you connect to your emotions. Uh, and for somebody like me, I can't just talk about the animal like it's... Uh, you know, some kind of idea. I have to experience it, but I can't, not really, not all the time. I need her to do that, to offer that for me. And, and part of it is a dialogue and an emotional connection. And the other part is her creativity, where she can anchor in a physical form something I can see and say, you know, that's it, that's it. That then goes in and it kicks everything else off. And it says, yeah, the, the, the unconscious agrees and it projects stuff mm. out and we go and we're away and we can be creative. Mm. And it's a dual process and we're both involved in that. Do you remember more recently, Steve, when we were watching, uh, was it the Catarix video? Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. at the beginning Ooh. of it, oh, he's, he's off. <laughs> oh, don't don't, don't you, go there. <laughs> you can hear all this, almost like If, I, if, if I were a tortoise, I'd, 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 yeah, I'd, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, but, the, but it's yeah. an example of how these things just suddenly oh, yeah. come seized, for you it moment. just sees the moment didn't it and uh, you could hear all this chattering these voices at the beginning yeah, that you yeah. maybe hadn't quite attended to no, before I'd, I'd, I'd seen the video hadn't i you'd seen the video many times and we know the band well yes we know the the, the two people who, who appear visually in that that's good. Mm. I, I think we can quite confidently say are close friends and they're, they're creatively linked with us uh, yeah. very deep. We, you know we, we've met them and we're working with them uh, on a soundtrack and yes. this particular track i'd seen it yeah i'd also love it you you've know, seen it many it, times seen it many times but it was the moment in which it played and yeah. then the synchrony between the outer and the inner produced mm. a reaction in me which just blew blew yeah. the cork off you yes. know and uh well i i, I said to you it almost sounds like the voice of the ancestors uh, and stop it sorry <laughs> but in, in that moment you'd actually and, and it would probably only be minutes you'd kind of written something yeah, 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 or it yeah. wrote itself um i uh i i, I had a a depersonalization you if you did. like yeah and it was, uh, it's very hard Sorry, actually Steve, no it's okay it because spot, but it was just illustrative if i, if I, if I go there mm. again uh, i'll uh, i'll i'll just freeze yes. and disappear inwardly <laughs> yeah you know uh, but also have a massive emotional reaction because in that moment i got the i got the characterization you did. uh the the complete narrative the beginning of yes. the story it's through line everything yes. everyone the names of all the characters and it was nothing that i considered before yeah. to do with a follow-on trilogy to a trilogy that these guys are working on mm. um and it was the massive impact of that as a symbol and as an emotional effect bridge and then an internal push 
you know, which I talk about instinctive pressure and archetypal pressure, uh, ganging up and pushing this stuff along the, the ego self axis and it's a boom, you yes, know, it did. And, and, and that's, mm. uh, that's an important thing. If I'd have been in a different frame of mind, that could have led to a very unpleasant mental state. Yeah. yeah. Because it was contained through a creative narrative. Mm. That was fine. Mm. You know, uh, mm. and I could probably access that again. Thank you, Paul. Oh, sorry. Damn near triggering <laughs> that now. Uh, and I'd have an on screen psychosis. You know? um, We'd get lots of views. It would not go in vain. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. If you're oh. going to do it, you may as well do it in style. You know, you're going to pop your psychological cork, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. th 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 that's how that works with me. And yes. Pauline is, is uh, an essential weave to my creativity. Um, I don't believe I could have done it without it. I really don't without that relationship to it. And it's in the sense of any mm. artist having, and, and yeah, an artist as a creative having a muse, but she's not a passive muse at all. She's someone who co-creates and can uh, help me reach parts that I might be too distracted by my normal consciousness, uh, by my normal Myers-Briggs type of INTP, you know, uh, and therefore not access what I need to access. And I guess I do know that if I do go insane, she'll pull me out of it. So in, in that sense... Um, it's, it's, I just say, have you had any lunch yet? Does some, something well, mundane that's it, that's like it. that? I mean, <laughs> If I'm here writing, which I am sometimes, and Paul's in another room drawing, and uh, I go bonkers, I might, not be able to, I, might, I might not be able to get downstairs to meet her, and, and then she forgets to feed me, and I'll definitely die. <laughs> Lord, Lord, you're a delicate soul at heart, aren't you, Steve? Very, oh, very, yes. very, 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 yeah, very yeah, sensitive. Yes. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, yeah. Got, I've got two high, high pressure hoses in here, <laughs> you know. uh, but, but I do have to feel it. If yeah. I don't feel it, I know it's inauthentic, I cannot write prescriptively, no, no. and you know, America, right? If you write a script for, for mm. an American uh, producer or, or whatever, then they have a certain page size and it's different. The English script standard page size is bigger. And both both of them say, right, one page a minute for the screen. I say, okay, so the American minute's faster than the English minute, is it? Because it's shorter. It makes no sense at all. So I, I just mm. ignore all of that. And, yes. I, and, and somebody says to me, well, when, when does the script how do you know when to end well it tells itself the story tells itself if you let it uh, and it doesn't matter how long it is you know yes. or how short it will tell itself because the narrative will work itself through and it will do because it's accessing archetypal and therefore instinctive and therefore genomic narratives that's it that's the collective source that's in virtual form yes i agree with young on that but the interaction between your life experience, the culture and the times within which you live, the relationship that you have, and all of these things produce that resultant, that dialectical effect, which is the creative process. And it emerges uniquely in that moment. Yeah, I guess the lesson is don't let anyone else cramp your style either. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you're self taught. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm self taught yeah. with respect to my art. Uh, yeah. Lots of people are. Um, yeah, I think that's the way to go if you possibly can. Yeah. Is is to to do it yourself and yeah. and don't be constrained by other people's ideas about how you should be doing it. Yeah, and, and don't believe it. You mm. can't do it. Yes. Don't believe that. Yes. You dream. Mm. Yeah. If you dream, you can be creative. Yeah. You dream every night. Yeah. If, if you can drift off in your mind, you can be creative mm. because you're not, you know, stuck in your preoccupations of the moment. Mm. Yeah. It's all there. Anyone, yeah. anyone can do it yes. in one medium or another mm. or several. Who knows mm. until you try. I can't draw. I really, really seriously can't. But I can paint pictures in here. Of course you can. And then I can put them into words. Yeah. And then I work with musicians who paint them emotionally. Yes. And I work with artists who paint them in a different kind of exterior visual way. And we all work together, but independently, because we're all down at that same deep structure level. Mm. And I have confidence then. That, the, that what we all produce will be synergistic and we'll, we'll, be on this, we'll be on the right track. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I do resonate with your story a little bit, Steve. Obviously, you've, you've, you've taken it way further than I ever have. Um, but I, I always used to hate the idea that I was a creative because at school, I used to identify with being a scientist and a mathematician. And I was like, mm -hmm. who needs art? You know, who needs literature? Who needs all of this stuff? It doesn't help anybody. Only when I got a little bit older and a little bit wiser, I realized that was complete and utter nonsense. But I, I have been a writer basically 
I wouldn't say my whole life, but like I was like 11 or 12 years old when suddenly I was sitting, I was doing, you know, whatever an 11 or 12 year old does. And then an idea for a story came to my head and I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I opened up, you know, Microsoft Word 2003 or something. And I was, I was there, like jotting all the different ideas down. But I always used to leave it. It was because I was, um, I, I wanted to be a writer for a little bit. And I'd look up on YouTube, I'd talk to my teachers and they'd be like, oh, how can I be a good writer? And it was, it was very prescriptive, yeah. actually. It was like, well, you've got to picture the character here and now imagine what he's got in, in his pocket and mm-hmm. all of these other standard things. I was like, ah, I don't like that. No. So I, I kind of like, I would like leave the, the stories and I'm still yeah. writing them now, yeah. 11 or 12 years later. Mm-hmm. But what, what would always happen is it would be bursts. I don't know if it would be the same mm-hmm. as you, but it would be yeah. bursts where I, I would never think yeah. about the story and then say like six months later or something, I, an image would come to mind yes i'd be like oh okay i remember a very very distinctive one i was with jane at the time we were very very close we were Mm in a we were in a hotel Mm -hmm. in um in paris Mm -hmm. and uh this this image of a character came to mind i was like whoa and then the name came too i was like oh okay and then the entire story arc came too at the exact same time it wasn't like i I tried to it was like it powered through now looking back on that character Mm -hmm. and what happened to the character years ago through looking at it's like a like a post hoc a, a analysis, it's me. Yeah. It's actually me. It's like almost like precognitive what ended up happening to me. The current state I was in, say end of twenty nineteen, with all all of my things. There's even a character in there who's who's like a scientist who has to leave the lab for some particular reasons to go off and do something else. Like that's me. Yeah. Like so it almost yeah. it's like the, the the personal myth was coming out in the form of spontaneous yes. create yeah. cre- cre- creativity. Yeah. It's like I've had zero conscious influence on this whatsoever. So so I guess, I guess the general thing is it was anticipated. Uh, from within yes. the genome, and it, I'm afraid the people who don't like biology, hard cack on that, I'm sorry, mm. but it must be from within there. It must yeah. be, and it's released, it's released, and uh, as Jung said, the future mm. casts its shadows backwards, but that's not a metaphysical or, 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 you know, a transpersonal thing, it's a biological thing, because the whole of our life, effectively, as a release of the genome expressing itself, is anticipated, and the, our psychology is part of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I I gave the pitch of these books to to Jane a few months ago because I kept it as my my deep, deepest darkest secret. Mm. I was like, I don't want this to be bad for some reason. It was always a value judgment, and only only when I went to go write the pitch for, it, I was like, this is way too complicated for me to actually tell somebody about. Yeah. It's just it's just a thing, and it's like multi layered, multi generational, mm. multi things. Even one one of the characters as well, precognitively ended up in kind of like I won't I won't spoil anything obviously, mm. but philosophically the way I turned out was the way this character turned out mm. yet when you're reading the book the idea would be that he's the character who potentially people would find the best and the most interesting and to follow but really it's it, it, it's all precognitive and it's all incredibly weird so i guess when it comes to a creative thing in the context of writing i've always presumed you shouldn't edit things consciously unless it comes to literally editing the words in terms of like ideas should it literally be a case of shut the ego off or the, the ego off and just let the ideas sort of come to mind yeah go with whatever works that's yeah thing. whatever works best for you i think i think part of the problem is if if um you're wanting to get your work out there is that the industry tends to like sound bites mm. and it would happily just strip you of your creativity if, if you let it um and there's so many people who jump on the back of your work as well and want to change it They don't actually produce anything themselves, but they don't like the way that you've done whatever you've done and they want to just pair it back or change it in some way. And at every stage, I think if you are truly creative, you have to resist that and and just persevere with the way you think or you believe it should be done yourself because there's so many people out there that would tell you no this isn't the right way and give up now and don't you know that only you know a very small percentage of, of people make it and so on um and it, it's that idea again going back to the red shoes i guess and the handmade life is it's one of perseverance if you truly believe in what you're doing you don't give up on this yes Yes, certainly. I mean, obviously, there is a difference between creativity for creativity's sake, which is something yes. which emerges naturally from you, and creativity to earn cash. Well, well, the well, very, very, very well, well there is. But uh, I mean, I think, I think the creativity, the, the desire to be creative, has to come first. If if you make money out of it, you know, further down the line, so be it. But I mean, that wasn't the motivating no, force for us, was it? It took us twelve years to yes. get where we are now. <clears throat> 
12 years because we knew no one and it takes a long time in this industry to, to, to rise up from the bottom of the pond mm. and uh, you meet a lot of weird characters oh, in do. there who, who would happily destroy you yes. and take everything you've got yes uh, and you draw all sorts of people all sorts of parasites you do you know um, mm. it, it's a long journey and it'd be very very easy to give up but we knew the material was good because of the kind of people who want to steal it off you at one level. Mm. Uh, and uh, the other thing were, were, were the actors, you know, uh, and, and then the directors and then the producers, uh, the people who said, this is good, I want this, I want to make this. And uh, without there being any money, any finance, people were attaching themselves to it. You, do, you don't get that. That doesn't happen, you know, because they won't do it. They won't no. put the names to it. But they were putting the names to it. They wanted it. So something right was going on, but we, we didn't think in a financial sense at all no. about that. It, it was uh, like the red shoes in the sense that you, you, you're being driven to do it. Um, but it's an internal drive. It's, it's, it's probably a little bit different because you, you're in service of something which is outside of yourself rather than serving your own ego, uh, which is one reason why I don't use my name. You know, I use a different name. Uh, for that because I saw it as a separate thing um, and I kept the different areas of my life separate although people are beginning to realize there's a cross fertilization now um, fair enough you know um, but there you go uh, for us it's just a continuation and, of everything uh, we've ever done we've ever done yeah. and a process in parallel yeah. as well of everything that we've ever done because we've used um, I mean uh, in America, for example, there's a young analyst over there who's used one of my novels um, with a girl who was suicidal. Yes. And it's, it, she said reading that book turned her around, even though it was fiction. And that's because of the character and the through line in it and the, and the, the, mm. the opportunity for individuation it gave that girl. So th that was really helpful. Uh, and other people uh, have just read the screenplays purely as a psychotherapeutic tool for themselves, mm. um, which, which is good too. Yes, yes. And I, I guess I want to make a little qualifier. Uh, you can tell me if you think that this is fair. Mm. The, wor the works are, that you produce are Jungian, but you don't need Jung to actually explain or validate the work no, you've done. Well, the, the art in and of itself it's justifies good. itself in and of itself. Yes. That's a really good point. The one thing, one thing that um, I, I didn't consciously, uh, until I became conscious of it, uh, move away from this, but... Yeah, yeah, people who, who, who say, right, we're going to have the self archetype and there's the shadow and there's that. Yes. No, no. <clears throat> this, this, this has to be something that impacts people at an emotional level. And it'll only do that if these so called archetypes are really there. The minute you try and make a pastiche of them and glue them in, uh, is the minute, frankly, for me, something like that becomes repulsive. I, I hate fake material like that, that that has been put together consciously as if to uh influence people and then attract people and say look there's the self archetype and yeah. there's the the wise old man and, oh, like, and to me that's utter crap because it's been consciously done it's the difference it's between, contrived isn't it it's contrived mm. that's the word it's the difference between a sign and a symbol a sign is something which is consciously contrived a symbol is something which is just what it is mm. uh, and it stands for something beyond itself and uh, for me, the, the, the deliberation is access to emotion first and then the bridge to instincts and then the archetypes appear. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, with that, I think we should uh, close off. This has been going for almost two hours. Unless there was anything else you two would quite like to say on this, on this topic? Um, no, I guess just to go back to um, the, the, the first part of it when we were talking about the, the technical use in psychotherapy, the, um, all these different techniques, and there are more than those that, are, that have just been uh, listed. Uh, we all had uh, protocols that we train people in the use of each of these techniques. So they're not just applied willy nilly or even intuitively. Everybody is assessed properly. Assessment is so, so important yes. uh, because that's the framework on which you build your experience and check your, your experience against. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic thing and it's, a, it's an amazing privilege to work with people in depth and you mm. learn so much. Mm. And I know I'm, I'm saying to people, get away from theory, get away from the abstraction of it. Obviously, everyone has to start the journey, but please go on the journey. Don't, don't arrest yourself. Don't limit yourself by other people. And that would include us mm. or, or anybody like that. Mm. If, if you have a calling, a true calling for this, you will not be able to stop. 
you you will go on the journey and you will make your own discoveries and you and you will find the truth the objective truth that's lived out through your own life please do that yeah. and I, I, so, oh, so no, no i was just going to add that it's um it's never too late to return to things either no. i mean i i did well in school at art and i had to make a decision i guess when uh, i was 18 as to you know what career path i was going to take and it happened that it wasn't art it was it was something else but you can always return to things and you know even if there's a large gap of time and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pick up from where you left off because sometimes things just accelerate naturally so don't presume that if you you know you're trying to say for myself when I actually resume my art again after a, a long break in time, that I was going to necessarily just do what I did at school. I had to find a way of upping my game so that I was picking up on my own potential that, that, that was there at the beginning. So it wasn't just a case of there was a big gap of time and I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be any better now than I was when I was 18, for example, because that doesn't have to happen either. And if you, if you think in that way, it could become inhibiting. You might think, well, what's the point? I've wasted all that time in between. So it's, it's never too late, never too late. And, and, and with respect to your writing, Steve, it took a while, didn't it, for you to... To, yeah. to pick that up, although you, you'd always written articles, you'd always been Ooh, good at writing. Yeah, I've uh, had art, articles published since I was age 18, and, yes. uh, and professional papers, yes. and, and yes. scientific stuff. So you were always very good at but it. But the, uh, the, yeah, yeah, I was actually, you to, were. to be honest, no, you were. my, my paper yeah. was pretty good in the police, uh, so much so that uh, yes. top barrister said you should be a barrister. Yeah. It was uh, yeah. Lord Levinson, actually, as he became, yes. but that, that's, another, that's another story. Yeah. But the, the, the creative writing, uh, didn't happen until I was 50, 51, yes. and it's been 13 years yeah. since then now, yeah. getting on for, so, yeah, yeah, it's never too late. No. Hmm. It's a very, very inspiring ending. I like that. Thank you, you two, as always, you, for... for choosing to have a conversation with myself. Thank you for everybody else who's watching. As always, there is a free link to download our uh, Integrate Your Shadow manual, which you'll find in the description down below. And as well as that, there are loads of um, perks and things which you can go over and check out on our Patreon page, which is a conversation with us, joining our community, asking us questions and things like that. I think the most important thing though is for everybody listening to this, when it's appropriate to go out and see how creative they can be. It'll probably be a nice thing for people to go out and do, to go and live their own lives as yes. they were meant to do. Yes. So with that, Lessons cheers. Talk to you all again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.